website as we've done in the past. So I'm starting the recording now. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to share with you. I'm going to share this screen with you. We can see that. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, brilliant. Um, I'm going to de-share that screen and share another screen. Thank you everybody for, for joining us today. It's quite an exciting day. Our Concrete Fix the Series started last year um, as a result of the COVID and putting a, uh, putting a stop to our physical events. We've been, we've been using Concrete Fix the Series to bring you the latest in, in, in concrete technology. And we're carrying on today, but under a new banner. In the meantime, the Concrete Society of Southern Africa, the Concrete Institute, and ACMP, the Association of Cementitious Materials Producers, have amalgamated into one new body called Cement and Concrete SA. We launched at the beginning of this month and it's been hectic, but it's been hugely exciting. And we realize that together we can build a future. I just want to share with you the partner members of Cement and Concrete SA are AFRISAM, Lafarge, PPC, and Sapaku. And we say a huge thank you to them for all the work that they've done, for the support that they've given the three bodies to come thus far to create this new body. It really, we are really excited about what the future holds for us. Um, from a concrete society perspective and for the other bodies, it was not, it didn't make sense to carry on as three individual bodies. We realized that there was confusion in the industry as to who was doing what. We also realized that um, the, the time maybe has passed for the same old service offerings and that, that we had to bring these three together under one roof to be able to serve our industry better. Now I've mentioned the, the partner members, but for everybody else that there are many more membership options. We've got a whole range of individual options or company options, corporate options, and the, the variety of memberships will include many benefits from access to the online information center, the biggest information center in, in Africa, access to the advisory desk, that is where our technical staff can give online advice, access to um, or at least discount to the courses presented by the School of Concrete Technology. And the, the ideal thing there is that all the courses at the moment are being, being presented virtually, which means that nobody has to travel, nobody has to worry about the social distancing and that it makes it so much easier to attend one of the online courses. Um, discounts on technical publications, and I think you should keep that in mind because um, I think it is time to let you know that the 10th edition of Fulton's Concrete Technology will be uh, published later this year. We're looking forward to seeing a hugely updated and new edition of Fulton's Concrete Technology. For members, there will also be discounts on consulting services by our um, team of, of engineers, um, listing in the Concrete Society, uh, the Cement and Concrete SA directory, which is the old source book, which will no longer be printed, but will be available online, and hyperlink logos in Concrete Baton and on the website. So if you're at all interested in any membership options and to find out what these options are, you can talk to Natasha and her email address is at the bottom of the screen, but Natasha has also interacted with all of you on this webinar, so you would have had an email from her. It's natasha.pulse at semcon-sa.org.za. So for any membership information, please contact Natasha and find out where you can slot in, where you can, can benefit and become a member. 
Remember that the School of Concrete Technology is up and running, as I've just mentioned. Their full education program is available on the website. You can go to the website, which is www.semcon-sa.org.za to get information on the courses that are available. Um, later this year, in July, we're very pleased to have the White Crets 2021 Symposium. Now, this has been a long time in the making, and Janina Kanji, who's online at the moment as well, is the convener of this um, uh, seminar of the symposium, and it aims to create the platform to bring together young individuals who works in our um, field of expertise in South Africa. It was supposed to have taken place um, last year. We had to postpone it because of the COVID lockdowns, and we've decided that despite, and unfortunately, despite the fact that we cannot have a, a physical event, we're going to go ahead. It's a virtual event, but when last I, I spoke to Janina, she has had more than 45 abstracts from young professionals all over. So we're really looking forward to this event, which is taking place on the 13th and 14th of July. More information also available on the Simcon Cement and Concrete SA website. And um, for those of you on Twitter, go on Twitter. Um, Janina has loaded exciting um, bits and pieces on there already. Remember that the quarterly journal Concrete Baton is now an exclusively online journal, but it's carrying on. It can The March issue can be read on the website already. Please go and have a look at it. And then let me just say that we, the Consolidated Cement and Concrete SA, we're looking forward to being the body to take the industry to new heights. And to be part of it, we urge you to become a member of Cement and Concrete SA. We really believe that there's a place for everybody and everyone. Thank you. And I'm stopped my, my screen share. And now I'm going to hand you over to Professor Julius Ballam, who is actually the, the speaker for today, as you will know. And I think because it is Professor Ballam, that is why we've got such a good turnout today. He's well known in our industry, but nevertheless, I'm just going to read you a very short um, biography of Professor Bellum. He's, he's a very modest man, and whenever you ask him to talk about himself, you get the bare minimum. But nevertheless, let me tell you, Professor Bellum holds a BC, MSc, and PhD degrees in civil engineering from WITS. And after six years in the construction industry, he was awarded the Portland Cement Institute which was one of the forerunners of today's Cement and Concrete SA research fellowship, a fellowship based at WITS, and he was awarded that in 1989. And then he was appointed as a lecturer in 1992, and he currently holds a personal professorship in civil engineering at WITS. He was the head of the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering from 2001 to 2005, and his research is mainly in Cement and Concrete Material Science and he has held a National Research Foundation rating as a researcher since 1994. He is a senior member of RILEM and has served on a number of the international technical committees. He served as the founding president of the African Materials Research Society and held the Bram Fisher Oxford Fellowship in 2000. Between 2006 and 2012, he served as the deputy vice chancellor, academic and the vice principal at WITS. He served two terms as a member of the Commission of Higher Education South Africa and was chair of the Higher Education Quality Council. He is presently a member of the Council of um, Omaluzi, where he also serves as chair of the Assessment Standards Committee. In 2012 and 2013, he was chair of the board of the National Institute of Higher Education in the Northern Cape and has recently ended a six year term as vice chancellor of the new Salt Lake University in Kimberley. So dare I say, Kimberley's loss is Gauteng's gain, and we're very happy to have Professor Ballam um, with us today. I think the terms that he served in more, call it administrative positions, he was a frustrated researcher. And it is so lovely to have him back full on in a research capacity to share with us. And the topic of his presentation today, as you can see on the screen, 
heat of hydration of cementitious materials and early age temperature development in large concrete elements. Eunice, over to you. Thank you, Anli, um, and uh, thank you for that unduly long introduction, uh, <laughs> but that was kind of you. Uh, and thank you to Cement and Concrete South Africa for inviting me and asking me to, uh, and agreeing that I present this, uh, this lecture. I'm going to show my video uh, for two reasons. One is, uh, as, a, as a sort of a rebellion against uh, lockdown culture, I chose to wear a tie today. Uh, but secondly, I hope you can notice, that certainly the older peer amongst you will notice that I'm wearing uh, the Concrete Society tie that was produced in 1994, um, when Concrete Society was 25 years old. Uh, well, the 57-year-old organization, as Hanvi has informed you, has died. Um, and we now have a new organization called Cement and Concrete SA. And I'm sure we look forward to th th those developments. Um, I do want to take a pause a moment to, um, uh, sorry, I need to get this going. There you go. I, I wanted to dedicate this uh, the seminar to, to really my one-time student, uh, research colleague and friend, Dr. Peter Graham. Uh, Peter succumbed to COVID-19 uh, infection earlier this year, and uh, it was a sad loss. Um, and, he, and Peter certainly, those of you who don't remember Peter, he was the, CEO of Slagment at the time, uh, retired, um, and I think um, probably irritated his wife in, in the home, and so she put him out into the garden, he came to bits, and he did a PhD, uh, and spent a long time working with me. And Peter certainly made a, a big contribution to the work that I'm about to present uh, today, especially in its early development phase, yeah. Um, so just a quick overview, I'm, I'm going to talk about um, uh, cement hydration and the rate of heat evolution. I'm, I, I'm sorry for those of you who, for whom this is a familiar subject, I am going to go to the basics uh, a little bit. Um, and then I want to talk about uh, the, this idea of measuring the rate of heat evolution in cement, why that is important. Uh, I'll talk about the form of expression of that heat rate function. Uh, and the need to, to normalize the heat rate function uh, using a maturity approach rather than a, a clock time approach. Um, I'll also talk about the development of a finite difference temperature prediction model that I developed, uh, some experimental verification of that model. Um, and then we'll talk about, I'll, I'll sort of give you an illustration of the sort of material and concrete uh, uh, variables that influence uh, uh, temperature development in concrete structures. Um, and more re of more recent uh, uh, developments with the model, but also some applications on, on large concrete structures uh, recently in, in, in South Africa. Um, so the first thing to remind you is that cement is a crystalline material. Uh, this is a, a microscope image of a, a cement clinker from a fairly typical South African cement plant, uh, if, if one can speak of a typical plant. Um, the, the, this is a, a microscopic view of a polished section that was then etched with hydro hydrofluoric acid. Um, and we're looking at it under reflected light in, uh, under the microscope. Uh, just note the bar, the, the scale marker is 25 micron down at the bottom, but cement is essentially made up of four important crystal structures. Uh, these very large hexagonal uh, tricalcium silicate, or what we call a light. Uh, then there's this nodular round grape-like structure called uh, uh, dicalcium silicates, uh, or the so-called B lights. And then the white to brownish interstitial material uh, that makes up the matrix is really aluminate phases, uh, tricalcium aluminate and tetracalcium aluminoferrites. These four crystal structures dominate the hydration characteristics and in fact dominate the, the heat release uh, characteristics as, as we will talk about in a short while. Uh, just a few characteristics about this picture that I'm showing you. The reason I pointed out the scale marker is you can get a sense that that crystal over there, the top one, is about 40 micron across. Now, if you remember that a, a cement grain Cement grains are generally smaller than about, uh, what would be, uh, 40 micron. 
most most cement grains of in, in the order of about five micron. Uh, it's quite easy to see that it is possible to have a cement grain that is made up of only one crystal type, or a cement grain that crosses the boundary has a little bit of uh, interstitial material, has a little bit of tricalcium silicate. So cement grains in themselves are not necessarily homogeneous, and they do behave in different ways. I also want to make the point that not all Portland cements are born equal, uh, depending on which cement plant you get your cement from, uh, what their raw materials are, what their pyroprocessing approaches are. You can get very different materials. And here is another South African uh, cement plant uh, producing a very different clinker. Here you see the, the B light, the dicalcium silicate, almost in this dendritic form. It looks like leaves. Uh, you see intergrowth of large uh, tricalcium silicate crystals uh, growing into each other. Lots of, uh, in this particular case, magnesium oxide, this little sort of greenish material, uh, peri so called periclase. And so, what you buy in a bag or in a, a, um, a truckload of cement can be very, very different materials that will, in fact, behave very differently. So, just keep that in mind. Not all Portland cements are the same. And I will show you almost a, a, a heat fingerprint of different cements in the country. Um, just again to remind you, you when, we add cement, when we add cement to water, we produce calcium silicate hydrate. So we go from a crystalline cement to a largely amorphous calcium silicate hydrate. And we produce a crystalline calcium hydroxide, which is really just lime, slaked lime. Um, for every uh, kilogram of cement that is hydrated, we produce about uh, 0.75 of a kilogram of CSH and about 0.25 of a kilogram of calcium hydroxide. The CSH is responsible for strength development, um, engineering properties, all the things we know and like about concrete. The calcium silicate hydrate really doesn't contribute to engineering properties, but contributes to the chemical stability of the material. Um, there are large amounts of it in, in cement. We need to be aware of it. It has mainly durability interest, uh, which we're not going to talk about today. But the important point for today's uh, discussion is that in the process of going from cement to producing calcium silicate hydrate, we release about 300 kilojoules per kilogram uh, of energy per kilogram of cement hydrated. That's a large amount of energy. Um, uh, uh, the Portland Cement, uh, what was then the Portland Cement Institute, CNCI, now Cement and Concrete, when they run their courses, uh, I don't know if they still do this, but they put a, an egg in a kilogram of uh, cement paste and tomorrow morning you have a boiled egg. There's enough energy there to boil an egg uh, if you can keep all the heat in here. The pore water, of course, goes from, a, uh, from uh, the pH of the pore water goes to about 13,2, uh, which is very close to the maximum of the pH scale. Uh, and that's mainly because of this calcium hydroxide and the alkali metals in, in the pore water. If we to focus on, on the heat evolution, this is a, a fairly typical or classical uh, diagram of the rate of heat evolution. There's an initial, initial stage in which you get a, a little peak of hydration, which happens because of the very early hydration of the illuminate phases. Uh, illuminates uh, uh, hydrate fairly rapidly, produce a fair amount of, amount of heat, but there's not much of it around. The gypsum in the cement, which the cement manufacturer kindly added so that you don't um, have your concrete uh, hardening inside the mixer, then kicks into action, reduces the rate of hydration, and you have a period in which you can transport this material, uh, place it into the formwork, compact it, float off the top surface, and, and then when uh, that effect has been lost, it's mainly the tricalcium silicates that kick into hydration process. And that produces this early heat profile that you see going up here. Um, the heat rate then, remember this is a heat rate, not total heat. Uh, the heat rate peaks off, it decreases. There is sometimes, you don't always see the shoulder, but that's the conversion of ettringite in the, in the paste to monos monosulfate. Um, and you see a, a little shoulder on the peak of your, on, a, on the, the downward 
a part of the curve and things slow down, hydration continues for a very long period uh, while more and more cement is hydrated, uh, strength is gained slowly. But generally, this is the part that we're interested in because it really is what contributes to our 28 day strength uh, characteristics. So we have these three very distinct stages. Uh, that's the early stage, you're placing your concrete, uh, working it, transporting it, etc. Uh, in initial hardening up to about 28 days and then long-term strength gain happens here, mainly hydration of the dicalcium silicates. That's those round nodular crystals that I showed. Um, the problem that I'm gonna talk about today is really a, the problem of trying to understand how temperature develops. Remember temperature is a consequence of heat. Temperature is not heat, just as uh, falling is a consequence of gravity. Um, Temperature, we're interested in temperature because we can measure it. Heat is a lot more difficult to measure, but we are interested in temperature because we also know that our materials behave and respond in particular ways to different temperature environments. Essentially what we've got, if I can simplify it uh, for, this, uh, for the purpose of this lecture, is a block of concrete, uh, two dimensional. Uh, we've got a point A, which is in the center of the block near the center. We've got a point B, which is near the side. What we do know is that as the concrete heats up because of the heat of hydration, uh, the inside will rise to a temperature and eventually will start um, uh, declining, will cool down until eventually it gets to ambient temperature again. That can be, depending on the size of the element, can take a very long time. Um, people who measure temperature at Hoover Dam at the time of construction estimated that it took just over 20 years for the core of the dam concrete to get back to ambient temperature. That's 20 years, that's a long time. What we also know is that the concrete near the surface will certainly see an increase in temperature. It won't be as high as the center and the cooling period will be a lot more quick or rapid than in the center. The problem that we face as concrete engineers, as designers, is if the temperatures at points A and point B are different, then the difference in the temperature could get up, it could set up thermal stresses, which will cause the concrete to crack. Initially, uh, during the early stages, those of you who worked on, on large concrete structures, uh, because the surface is cooler than the inside, the inside wants to expand, is being restrained by the cooler surface. The surface goes into tension and usually you actually see physical cracking on the surface. Those cracks are quite regular in their spacing. They're not very wide and they don't go very deep. They generally of the order of 50 or so millimeters. The more difficult uh, uh, phenomenon happens after the inside reaches its peak temperature and now wants to cool. And this could happen days, months uh, later. When the inside wants to shrink, wants to get smaller because it's cooling, is restrained by the now stiffer outside. And so the inside goes into tension. These cracks are usually larger. Uh, nobody sees them. Um, uh, Am I okay? Somebody called CRO has a, um, uh, a, a microphone on. Uh, the cracks are internal, they're usually larger, nobody sees them, and they can be a lot more uh, of, of greater concern, particularly around serviceability issues, uh, etc. So what we're trying to do is understand the temperature development across a block like this, that is cast onto a rock foundation, restrained by this rock foundation. And so therefore stress can develop. And <clears throat> more importantly, we're interested in temperature differences. In order to understand that, we have to solve what is called the Fourier equation, which I'm writing here in two dimensions. It has a, a first order differential with respect to time. Temperature changes in time at any particular point. Temperature changes with position across points. Uh, in this case, X and Y, uh, that's the thermal conductivity. And there's a, a, a term for 
the internal rate of each evolution. Okay, I'm going to spend a fair bit of time trying to understand how we arrive at this term. Uh, and that really is going to be the, a large part of this lecture. On this side, uh, rho, uh, the density of the concrete, the specific heat capacity, specific heat capacity is the amount of energy required to change the temperature of one kilogram of the material by one degree C, okay? That's the specific heat capacity. That's an inherent property of the material and you can determine it experimentally or calculate it. So that really is the situation that I'm gonna to try to cover in, in today's lecture. Um, let's start by thinking about how we're going to determine the rate of each evolution. So what we would need to do is measure the temperature change of a hydrating cement sample over time. Okay, if we can do that, if we can measure the temperature change, as I said, heat is difficult to measure, temperature is easier. So if we could measure the temperature change of a, of a concrete sample, or a cement paste sample, uh, what we would be able to do then is to calculate the, the amount of energy simply by multiplying by the specific heat capacity. Normalizing for the mass of the sample divided by the mass of cement, and that will give us the energy per kilogram of cement, okay? Uh, not, not really a particularly difficult physics problem. All we need is to know the temperature differences. If we then, can, if we then accumulate the changes in temperature over, over time, we can develop a total heat curve. And if we then uh, differentiate that curve, we can get uh, the rate of heat evolution. So dq by dt is then estimated as the change in heat divided by the change in time. And that gives us the dq by dt that we need to solve the Fourier equation that I showed a little earlier. As the thermal calorimetry is, calorimetry is generally become very commonly used in the cement industry, However, at the time that we were developing our approach, uh, isothermal calorimeters were few and far between. They were very expensive. So we built our own adiabatic calorimeter. Adiabatic, just to remind you, is uh, you create a condition under which there is no exchange of heat between the sample and the environment. So if you can stop the movement of heat from the sample to the environment, you've got adiabatic conditions. And all the heat that is chemically developed by the cement is kept inside the sample. If we can do that, then we know that all the heat and the temperature change, then the temperature changes are entirely due to the heat of hydration. And we can then go through this process and determine the amount of heat that was developed. It's not a difficult process. And I'll show you how we did that. Um, this is really a, a, a schematic diagram of our, our calorimeter. Um, we don't show you a photograph because the water level is controlled with a toilet valve. So it's a completely home-built uh, calorimeter. Works very well. Uh, um, and it was included in uh, an international round robin test program. Um, so what we do is we take a tank filled with water. We put a sample of concrete inside the water. We have a heater element in the tank. We have a stirrer in the tank, but the motor that drives the stirrer is outside the tank. Uh, the reason for that is we don't want the motor to put heat into the water. Uh, we have a temperature probe in the concrete and a temperature probe in the water. All of this is connected to a computer system with a, a, a power supply uh, in case ESCOM lets us down. Um, and the computer monitors the temperature of the concrete sample, switches on or off the heater so that the water is exactly the same temperature as the sample. And so as the sample heats up, we heat up the water and the two follow each other. And if we can maintain that, then what we've done is we've created adiabatic conditions. Um, the, the, the cable of the, the temperature probe in the, in the sample comes out through a tube at the top. The tube is blocked with um, cotton wool. So we don't develop pressure inside of this chamber. There's air movement but there's no bulk air movement. Uh, we can relieve pressure, but we can't move bulk air. Sample is cast in a plastic bottle. We throw the plastic bottle away when we finish. And that really is our um, calorimeter. The clever part is the control system here. And those of you who remember George Gibbon, uh, that really was his PhD, was developing the control uh, system for ensuring that these two can, can remain at the same temperature. 
This is a closer view of our sample holder. Uh, people have tried this all around the world. It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and the reason is because of inherent errors in your temperature measurement devices. You start getting harmonic responses between two temperature uh, devices. Our contribution to knowledge in the world was to put an air, air pocket around the sample. Um, the air pocket acts as a dampener to eliminate any harmonic responses between as a result of errors in your um, uh, measurement devices. And really that's our calorimeter and it produces fairly good results. What we get out of the calorimeter, it takes about a few, a few days up to a week to run a test. Um, uh, what we get out of it is a plot of time versus temperature. And this would be a typical curve of the results that come out of the, the calorimeter. Um, what we do then is, as I said to you, we, we use this equation. So we look at uh, delta T, that's delta T there. We normalize by the mass of the sample divided by the mass of cement. We multiply by the specific heat capacity of the sample. And using that, we can transform that into a heat curve. So we transform that curve, the temperature curve into a, a heat curve, which is uh, on this side, total heat. You can see in this case, the case of the sample, we got to about 170, uh, 180 uh, kilojoules per kilogram of binder. And if we differentiate this curve, we get um, uh, a, temper a heat rate profile. You see in this case, we get this peak. We don't always capture this. Sometimes we're just a bit late and we don't capture that uh, initial peak. We get the tricalcium silicate hydration peak. We get a, a, a declining curve. You, in this case, you don't clearly see that shoulder that I spoke of, but you get the heat rate curve emerging. It's fairly simple and straightforward. Um, the physics is not that difficult uh, and it actually works quite well. However, we've got a problem uh, because as a chemical reaction and you can see a, a, an internal circular problem here, uh, the heat is being released through the hydration of the cement, which is a chemical reaction. The released heat causes a temperature increase. The temperature increase stimulates the rate of reaction, which then stimulates the rate of heat evolution. And so you can see a circular problem. So dQ by dt at any time varies with the time temperature history of the, of the hydrating cement. And, and the problem is that in a large concrete structure, because each point in the structure undergoes a different time temperature history, Remember, as we said, the center gets hotter and quicker and lasts longer than the side. You have different heat rate functions. dQ by dt will vary uh, at all those points, even though it happens at the same clock time. So in fact, time is a useless uh, parameter in this, in this analysis. And we went in, uh, and looked at the possibility of using uh, uh, the Arrhenius function. This is a a commonly used uh, function in the world of chemistry uh, where, uh, where they try to simultaneously account for time and temperature in, in dealing with rates of reaction. And so here it's a, don't worry about the equation, it's an exponential function. Uh, that's the energy of the reaction, okay? This is the Rankine constant for those of you who remember your chemistry, but that E term is the energy of the reaction. In this case, I'm normalizing to the time that would have been required if everything was kept at 20 degrees C, okay? So in other words, if, if, uh, if the concrete uh, was cured, uh, we got to a temperature of 30 degrees C, the hydration would advance further than it would have for a companion sample that was at 20 degrees C. Well, I'm then calculating the equivalent time at 20 degrees C, and that's really what I'm doing. This equation allows you to do that. Those of you who recognize this, 273 is um, zero degrees C, uh, 273 Kelvin. 293 is plus 20 degrees C. And so we have a temperature difference and a time difference. And that gives us an equivalent time at 20 degrees C. Um, I can pick up this concept a little bit later if anybody wants me to, uh, but let me just illustrate uh, how this works. So what we did was we then decided that it must be right to normalize the, the, the heat rate function instead of dQ by dt, 
let's talk about dq by dm where m is maturity but of course the world doesn't move in maturity language it moves in clock time language so what we did was we effectively created an an imaginary time scale called maturity which allows us to do the analysis and then we go back to the real world of time using this dot product so dq by dt is simply dq by dm multiplied by dm by dt at the time that you are considering um uh, it, it takes a bit of time to get your head around this and as i say it's uh, it isn't actually that complex it's just the mathematics looks a bit difficult uh but let me let me illustrate the point to you by showing you what happened in the lab so what we did was we went into the lab with the suspicion that temperature would be a, a, an important variable and using exactly the same concrete with the same binder in this case it was a, a sem1 we did exact we, we started uh, the adiabatic calorimeter tests but we started at three different temperatures one at the first one at 13 another one at 21 degrees c and another one at 29 and as we expected we ended up with three different curves uh, as you can see here and that confirmed for us that there is not one single unique dq by dt curve for a cement, for a cement it depends on the temperature environment in which you involve and since the temperature environment changes in a real structure it means you have to account for millions of um, of uh, heat rate functions which is clearly unacceptable you can't you can't do analysis like that and what we needed to do was to see if it was possible to normalize the heat rate function we use the so so remember here the axis is heat rate on that side which is joules per second per kilogram joule per second is a watt and on this axis i'm plotting time clock time in hours okay if i transform the axes take the same data transform the axes into maturity axes those three curves collapse onto a single curve um and here i'm plotting the maturity rather than time and on this scale i'm plotting uh maturity heat rate remember that is a joule per second this is a joule per maturity second where a second could be longer or shorter than a clock second depending on the temperature but once we did that we were able to normalize the heat rate function of course that was an important breakthrough because it then allowed us an instrument to go and solve the fourier equation uh, and really what we what all we needed to do was to use the dq by dm curve to do the calculation go back to dq by dt and then we could solve the fourier equation and so that allowed us to start doing finite difference analysis uh, and i'll talk about that just a, an example of uh, this is nine south african cements from nine different cement plants uh, you can see one clear outlier um by the way this was uh, this is along this is probably uh, 15 years ago peter graham did the, uh, produced these curves um so it's a long time ago plotted in maturity language uh but you can see that the point i made that you can almost get a a, a heat rate fingerprint for cement from a factory if you have a sense of the heat rate profile for the clinker from a particular factory uh you can produce this sort of uh, curve by the way these curves were uh lab manufactured cements so we collected clinker from the factory we ground it in the lab to make our own cements so in other words and we put exactly the same um so3 contents etc so what we did was we eliminated processing variables from chemist chemistry variables so what you're seeing here the differences you're seeing here is only clinker chemistry and clinker characteristics uh that is not as as a result of grinding at the factory um and as i said you can almost develop a fingerprint for a uh, for uh, cement from a particular plant um it, it certainly is probably be worth doing this again at some stage Uh, we need a conversation with the cement manufacturers yeah uh remember i showed you this model so what we what i did was i developed a temperature prediction model and i'll go through that fairly quickly uh, i wrote a finite difference model rather than a finite element model just because things happen very slowly in concrete our our dimensions are large uh, this is of the order of sort of hundreds of millimeters rather than millimeters um 
and the time scales of the order of one hour rather than a few minutes. So it seemed logical to go to find differences. Um, and then, of course, I needed an air temp uh, I needed to model the air temperature around the sample. Um, I simply superimposed a, a sinusoidal function. I'll show you that in a minute. And again, as I said, my concrete block is cast on rock, uh, a rock foundation. Uh, so this would be a typical large concrete element cast onto a rock foundation, subjected to air temperature that varies in some form. Uh, that's the equation I'm trying to solve. Just to remind you, that for those of you who've forgotten your mathematics, this is one-dimensional analysis. Um, I've got a, a point on a, in a continuum. That's point M I'm interested in. And point M is surrounded by a neighbor, M plus 1 and M minus 1. Um, the, the, first, uh, the second derivative at point M is the first derivative at M minus a half and M plus a half. And those first derivatives can be calculated numerically like this. So it's the temperature at M plus one minus temperature at M divided by delta X. And that will give you that, uh, the derivative at that point or the slope at that point, if you want. Uh, similarly at this point, and then if you take the difference between those derivatives, you get the second derivative. And that's what you see there. Uh, each time it's being divided by delta X. And that then tells you that the second de derivative is given by the temperature at the, the partner nodes and the temperature at the node that you are interested in. Uh, the de first derivative with time is simply the time at interval n, sorry, n plus one minus the time at interval n uh, the temperature rather divided by the change in time. That's simply the derivative. And so you can do these numerical, this is really computational analysis. Those of you who have forgotten your applied maths, perhaps uh, go back to it, but nothing, nothing very difficult and complex here. We set up, I set up the equations for these four scenarios. I'm interested in point P, remember, okay? Uh, in this case, P is an internal node surrounded by four neighboring nodes. It's it's exchanging heat with four neighboring nodes. In this case, P is a, a, a point on the rock foundation uh, surrounded by three concrete nodes and one node inside of the rock. In this case, P is a corner node surrounded only by two uh, partner nodes, sharing heat with uh, two nodes and externally exchanging heat with the um, uh, atmosphere, with uh, the environment, uh, through a heat transfer coefficient called H. Um, in this case, a P is a, a, a side node sharing heat with three neighbors and exchanging heat with the environment through a heat transfer coefficient called H. H depends on whether the formwork is in place or not and what type of formwork. If it's wooden formwork, H will be quite low. If it's steel formwork, it'll be about the same as if there was no formwork. When you remove the formwork, H then has to go up again and the model allows for that. Uh, the ambient temperature, as I said to you, I imposed a, a sinusoidal function. Um, this is actual data. It's not bad, I'm sure I could improve it, but it's not bad, um, seems to be okay. Um, we then went into the lab and cast a half a cubic meter of concrete. Um, we thankfully got a, a half a cubic meter from one of the local ready mix companies. Um, and uh, half a cubic meter mainly because that's 700 by 700 by one meter long. Um, we heavily insulated these ends, effectively making the element infinitely long in the Z dimension because heat cannot flow through or is limited in flowing through those axes. Um, heat really can only flow in two dimensions. Remember, I'm forcing the, 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 um, the test to, to look like my two dimensional model. We instrumented at these points along the central axis of the center of the block and horizontally and vertically. And those were the results. Um, fairly reasonable predictions of the maximum temperature at the center, the bottom temperature, in fact, very good uh, predictions down here. Not very good on the boundary. Uh, side face, we, the, the model is predicting a sinusoidal function uh, which the, the actual measured temperature didn't show. Uh, you can see it varying according to the ambient conditions. Similarly, at the top, uh, 200 millimeter deep, 
not not it's okay it's acceptable but it's really not uh, i think we had a boundary condition problem and i recognized this um and there's certainly room for improvement uh, for that of that model but just to use the model to illustrate some of the effects of what we're talking about here is three of those uh, heat of hydration curves that i showed you for the different cements south african cements i took cements d f and k and use them to predict the temperature in a large concrete block, four meters by three meters, uh, using only 200 kilograms of cement. Um, clinker D gives you the lowest temperature. This is the profile across the element at the time when the maximum temperature occurs. So these curves are not all at the same time, okay? It's at the time when the maximum temperature occurs. Clinker K get with the highest heat rate gives you the highest temperature. Um, and of course, clinker D gives you the lowest. But if you cast, started at 20 degrees C, or the surface is at 20 degrees C, you've got a 20 degrees C difference between the surface and the inside in this case. Here, you've got a smaller element, only half meter by half a meter, but with a much larger cement content with a higher strength. Let's say it's a ground beam or something. Uh, clinkers F and K make no difference. Clinker D makes a significant difference to the temperature of the development. Uh, so it's something to bear in mind is just the selection of your cement type in relation to the type of structure you are building. Um, this is the effect of cement fineness. The finer you grind your cements, um, the, 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 the total amount of heat will be about the same. Finer cements will give you more heat be just because you will hydrate more of the cement but the heat rates go up very significantly and it does affect the, um, the, way, the temperature development in the concrete. Typical uh, fineness for South African cements is about 3000 uh, square centimeters per gram. We ground these in the lab. We made some little more coarse. We made finer cements right up to almost 5,000 uh, square centimeters per gram. And that's the top uh, curve that you see there. So, you know, a, a, a fairly low heat rate uh, cement can be turned into a high heat rate cement just by, by grinding finer. And it's something that we need to keep our eye on with regard to fineness of grinding as well. Uh, here's an example of the effects of supplementary cementitious materials. This is, um, uh, in this case, it's uh, slag. Uh, slags, fly ash have a profound effect in reducing uh, rate of heat uh, of hydration. Interestingly, when you add slag, the more slag you add, uh, the peak goes down, but the peak happens earlier. Uh, so with slags, the peak, temp the peak heat rate happens a little bit earlier. With fly ash, it happens a little bit later. Uh, we need to understand that, and there's some, certainly something going on there. Uh, certainly an interesting question. Silica fume makes almost no difference, as you can expect. We would use 5, 10, and 15% makes almost no difference to the heat rate function, uh, really because silica fume itself is quite an, uh, 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 a powerful pozzolan, but in itself, it also stimulates uh, this, the further hydration of the cement. Um, so if you're going to be in a temperature sensitive structure, silica fume will really not help you to get to, to reduce the heat rates. Um, just some work we've been doing recently on isothermal calorimeter. Uh, calorimeter. These are two, uh, two isothermal calorimeters available in South Africa. Um, and here is one operated at 34 and a half degrees C. Or this, by the way, this is all exactly the same Portland cement. Okay, uh, Same mix, uh, same cement. Uh, I sent samples to the, the um, people operating these calorimeters and they undertook the test and then sent it back to me. So if you are, the calorimeter is operated at 34,5 degrees C, that's the curve you get. If it's operated at 20 degrees C, this red dotted line is the curve you get. So the, the temperature at which the calorimeter is operated, remember isothermal calorimeter works on the principle of measuring the amount of heat you need to remove from the sample in order to keep it at a constant a constant temperature. Remember, adiabatic is measuring the temperature um, increase and allowing the temperature to increase. Whereas with isothermal calorimetry, you're keeping the temperature constant 
and measuring the amount of energy that you need to remove from the sample to keep the temperature uh, at a constant value. In this case, the constant value is 34,5. In this case, the constant value is 20 degrees C. And so just so we need to be aware that these are very different curves. I've also plotted here an adiabatic curve that I produced in 2008 for a similar cement, a similar Portland cement, not the same, of course. Uh, and you can see that it, it and I've, I've, uh, the, I've reduced the adiabatic curve to 20 degrees C, uh, the equivalent 20 degrees C maturity curve. You can see that the, the, the adiabatic curve sort of looks similar to the to isothermal at 20 degrees C. And so clearly there's some correspondence between isothermal and adiabatic. It's an area that we need to interrogate a little further and get to perhaps a better understanding of. Um, I think now just to go to some improvements and then some, uh, I'll give you a quick uh, sense of so, some practical experience and, uh, that we've had recently. Uh, in, in an attempt to understand these boundary conditions, what we did was we went and on the top of our building here, Blitz, we, we went and measured solar radiation. Uh, but, and thankfully we had a, access to a net radiation device. So we were measuring exit radiation as well. Um, and what I show in this black line is actually the, the actual measurements in Johannesburg at the uh, Witz University on the 18th of February in the year when we did the measurements. I was interested in sort of summer, summer peak, uh, solstice and equinox values. Um, and so this was on the 18th of February in the year. The reason that you get these downward curves is because of cloud cover. Uh, so there were clouds passing by over Johannesburg and we, we sort of had these downward peaks. However, if I assume that the upper, the upper peaks what, are what would have happened if there was no cloud and I fit a, a, a cosine curve, then you can get a fairly good cosine curve fitting that data. So that would be what I consider to be a profile for a February curve solar radiation in Johannesburg with no cloud cover. But what is interesting about uh, this, uh, the instrument that we use is we're also measuring exit radiation at night. So we're finding that in Johannesburg, the exit radiation is about mm, uh, 80 watts per square meter. So your, the earth is, from Johannesburg is losing about 80 watts per square meter of, of radiation uh, as exit radiation. Uh, we did the same on the 23rd of May in that year and on, again on the 8th of June. And we got, these are the model curves, okay? Um, some of you are going to ask, why is it that in winter, correctly, uh, you, you get down to naught earlier than in summer, but you don't rise um, later uh, than in summer. But the reason is that it's the shadow from the neighboring building. Um, uh, the shadow has, <laughs> was influencing our instrument. We probably could improve this, but these are not unreasonable curves. And, and I think they, they sort of starting to give us a sense of the effects of solar radiation and the influence on the boundary condition of the model. Um, and I'll show you a case where we actually use the solar radiation as part of the boundary conditions. Uh, this happens to be a, a, a project that is currently under construction. Uh, the concrete elements are very large, and so the client, the, the client asked the contractor to cast a two uh, meter cube on site using the concrete and the materials and the mixture design that was approved for the construction of the large elements. Um, and so that's what they did. They cast effectively eight cubic meters of concrete, two meter by two meter by two meter, and they put six temperature probes in. Uh, vertically on the side, uh, sorry, down the center, and vertically down the side. Uh, the side probes are, as I recall, 50, uh, 200, uh, 50 millimeters from the side surface, but 200 millimeters from the top and bottom, okay? Uh, and so here's the measure, the blue line is the measured temperature, and my red line is the predicted temperature accounting for the measured variation in air temperature, but also accounting for solar radiation with exit radiation at night as well. And you can see the, the boundary condition, the prediction of the boundary conditions has improved quite significantly. We're getting much better at sort of predicting surface phenomena. Uh, this is the center middle. So these are the three centers 
center probes. Uh, this is the center bottom, center middle, center top. So that would be those three there. And if you look here, far more influenced by boundary condition, um, you, you certainly, these are the side, uh, the side probes, only 50 millimeters from the surface. So, so a lot more sensitive and a lot more subject to variation in ambient temperature. And you can see the models sort of looking reasonable. What that allowed us to do was then to predict the temperature differences in the actual concrete structure before they started construction. So, so armed with the fact that we were reasonably able to predict the temperatures that were measured in the two meter uh, element, two meter cube, we then went ahead and predicted temperatures and particularly temperature differences in the actual concrete structure. And what we did was I, I extended the model in for this particular project to allow for sequential construction. So in other words, you, you cast a layer of concrete, uh, in this case, two meters thick. Then you cast another layer on top of that before all the heat from the previous layer has been lost. And then of course you cast another layer on top of that. And I'm interested particularly in the middle layer because that is the condition that will happen for all uh, sequential construction layers. Uh, the contractor was keen to cast at, uh, if I recall, three day intervals. Uh, the client suggested about uh, 10 to 12 day intervals. And you can imagine there was a, a project timing issue. And so we, we, we did the, the analysis and came up with this sort of profile. So what happens here, the, the, sorry, the, the first, you cast the first layer of concrete, uh, the temperature goes up and then it peaks and it settles, starts going down, yeah. But before that happens, just at this point, after seven in the, the solid lines relate to seven day intervals, the dashed lines are for five day intervals. So after seven days, you cast another layer of concrete uh, and that layer goes up to a higher temperature. And then seven days later, you cast another layer on top of that. And so this temperature is higher because the new concrete from the third layer is putting heat into the lower layer. Uh, and so the middle layer is actually the most critical. You can see that with the dashed lines, the situation gets a little worse if you use only if you use five day intervals. Um, we sort of did the calculations and the contractor settled on a on a casting period. Excuse me. <coughs> uh, but this is the sort of analysis that was possible that we we sort of looked at it and allowed contractor and uh, client to have a reasonably sensible conversation about what was possible. You could also then start making decisions about whether you put a blanket on the top of the concrete uh, so that you minimize the temperature variation at the top and so minimize temperature differences. Because remember, it's temperature differences that cracks your concrete, not absolute temperature. And here we're calculating the temperature differences. So this is the first layer. Uh, you get the sinusoidal. This is the top surface to, compared to the center, OK? Uh, uh, sorry, I, I just wanted to point out here that in this particular case, we went up to about 55 degrees C in the model. Um, uh, here you see the concrete going, uh, the temperature difference is going uh, well as high as about 32 degrees. Uh, with seven day intervals, um, the temp worst temperature difference is in the center and the maximum is about 28 degrees C. Um, uh, and at five day intervals, it uh, sort of the, the, um, uh, the third layer, if you don't put a blanket on it, will go higher than that. Uh, the con between the contractor and the consultants, I think they settled for about, they could tolerate a seven day difference, um, particularly if they put blankets on the top and so on. And so some compromise was, was arrived at and it all worked very well. I should add that on this project, they completely neglected to uh, to cool the ingredients. And in some cases, we're placing the, all of this analysis assumed that the placing temperature of the concrete was less than 20 degrees C. I think I worked on 18 degrees C. They were placing concrete at, in some places 30 degrees C. And so they exceeded the maximum temperature allowance on the project. And there's a little bit of um, uh, conversation going on at the moment. I think they've resolved it. 
uh, but it was something that uh, that really it was a construction methodology issue that needed um, some attention. Just in conclusion, then, just some closing thoughts. Um, the, I guess the point that I'm making in all of this analysis is that good concrete technology and proper engineering design approaches approaches can minimize the risk of thermally in induced cracking. Um, we, we, however, have to pay attention to material selection, binder type, minimize the binder content in your mix design, use the largest coarse aggregate possible. If you are going to cast uh, concrete that is uh, sort of a large concrete dam or something, there's absolutely no reason why you should use 19 millimeter aggregate. Um, use a larger aggregate will allow lower cement contents, lower water contents, and so you'll reduce heat. Pay attention to construction methodology. What kind of formwork are you using? When, when are you casting this concrete? Is it worth casting at night? Uh, cool the concrete materials be before you mix. You may be uh, advisable to use ice as your mix water. Uh, consider cons uh, sequential construction, uh, insulation systems, post cooling systems, etc. And then, of course, don't forget internal reinforcement. If you're going to stop uh, control uh, uh, thermally induced cracking internally, joint spacing, grouting arrangements, internal reinforcements are all important. Uh, with that, Hanli, um, Kelly Bocha, and thank you very much to all. Um, I'm quite happy to take any questions or comments or criticisms. Um, I don't know if I should keep my screen in case somebody wants to refer to a slide, but please do go ahead. Thank you. Eunice, thank you so much. And please do keep the screen sh shared. Um, so we'll, we'll take a couple of questions. Anybody, please go proceed and ask your question. Uh, Hanley, could I ask a question? Please, please go ahead, Mark. Uh, Eunice, as Photographs that you gave at the beginning, those micrographs, um, which showed the critical form or habit of the clinker grains, and you showed just how very different they were from one clinker to the next. One of the questions I have is, could there be an influence of polymorphs in those uh, clinker grains in terms of the heat generation? So one C3S gives you a different fingerprint to another C3S because of polymorphs. You're on, you're on mute. You're on mute. Sorry. Eunice, you're on, you're on mute. Now, I, now I'm not. Apologies. Yeah. I was yeah. merely talking away. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, the point you're making is that uh, uh, what we, the, this, these things that we call C3S and C2S are in fact not, not single crystal types. Uh, and they certainly are not pure materials. Um, the different forms and different crystal uh, structures um, can have very different hydration characteristics. There is a sense to which polymorphs make very little difference, but Mark, it's not a question that I've tested at all. Um, um, in, the, in the case of the, the clinker that I'm showing at the moment, what is interesting is that some of the dicalcium silicates are growing inside of the tricalcium uh, silicate crystals. Mm -hmm. um, a feature you don't see in uh, the next clinker. You don't see. You don't see this. You see, however, uh, the morphology of the the dicalcium silicate is just very different. But you don't see big dicalcium silicate crystals growing inside the tricalcium silicates. I think that issues of cement chemistry. I mean, this is really a question we must ask our colleagues who are who are in the business of cement manufacture. Um, and it may be something that we, we explore a little further, uh, but that could well be a, a, a reason that these fingerprints look so different. Um, sorry, I, let me just get there. Yeah, this one. Uh, that, you know, there, there could be many reasons why the, the sort of, our thought is really um, uh, raw materials, uh, pyroprocessing yeah. characteristics, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you're right. There may well be many other yeah. reasons. Uh, yeah, we're not so many chemists, and we should be cautious. Yeah. And if I could follow that up with a quick question on this slide, I did have the slide in mind too. Uh, question of where these peaks occur and how they occur is quite dependent on the on the SO3 content on the sulfate addition. Um, and I'm just wondering if you added exactly the same sulfate to each of these clinkers, uh, you may not have optimized your hydration. Uh, uh, you know 
in the best way. That's it's just a comment. I don't know if you can respond yeah. to that. Yeah, certainly, Mark. No, we, we, it, it was not our intention to optimize. Uh, so, so what we did in this project was we went to to the each of these nine factories, uh, and we took clinker off the conveyor belt just before the clinker goes into the the, the grinding mill. And then we waited for about 15 minutes, which is about the throughput rate of the grinding mill. And we took another sample of cement downstream of the grinding mill. Grinding mill. What I'm showing you here is the profile of the concretes, uh, of the cements that oh, okay. were made from the clinker. That wasn't, that wasn't there is another me. set of curves, uh -huh. which, we, which is from the, the, the cement that was produced at the factory. But in that case, the, the curves are influenced by fineness of grinding, by SO3 contents, uh, uh, add, uh, the added grinding aids, et cetera, et cetera. And so I guess with each of those, you must choose your poison. We chose to compare on the basis of equal SO3 content and equal fineness of grinding. That's what mm -hmm. you see here. But you're right, it's not optimized, not at all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Eunice. Thank you, Mark. One more question. Anybody? Eunice, it doesn't look as though there are any more questions right now, but I really do want to thank you. Um, I think for everybody present, one of the big things is to know that research in South Africa is alive and well, and not just research for the sake of research, research with practical implementation. And that really makes us very happy in, in our industry. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you for sharing your time. Um, and please don't go away. We're gonna call on you again at some stage to share more with us. Thank you so much, Eunice. So thank you, everybody, thank you very much. Uh, everybody um, in the notice that Natasha sent around, she asked if you need CPD points for having attended the seminar, please make sure that she's got your EXA registration number. Natasha will commun communicate with you when the CPD points are available on the website. So um, keep your eyes open. We're using a third party a CPD accreditor at the moment. So it may take a couple of weeks, bear with us, but Natasha will communicate as soon as they are available online. And um, Eunice, you may find it in interesting to know that today we actually had somebody attending all the way from Croatia. So welcome to everybody from, from Africa, from Croatia, wherever you've, you've attended, you've logged in today. Keep your eyes open. We've got more webinars planned for the rest of this year, and we hope you found this useful. Remember to become part of the future of this industry in South Africa. Become a member of Cement and Concrete SA, and we see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you, Anli, and thank you all. Bye-bye.